Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 7, The Persistence of White Supremacy in the United States. Margaret Kimberly is an editor and senior columnist at the Black Agenda Report, which publishes news, commentary, and analysis from the black left. She is author of the book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents, which is an eye-opening and very well-researched volume published by Steerforth Press in February 2020. She contributed to the anthology In Defense of Julian Assange, which includes essays by three dozen other well-known figures, including Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, and Matt Taibbi. Margaret is also on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace, which seeks to recapture and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace positions of the radical black movement. I've been reading Margaret's work since the Obama years, when the Black Agenda Report came to my attention as a source for reliable and principled critique of U.S. society and politics, no matter who is president. The writers there were not afraid to call out Obama for his misdeeds, both domestically and overseas, and their truth-telling has continued unabated to the present. I had the great pleasure of meeting Margaret in person in Manhattan in August 2018, and a transcript of our conversation appears in my book, Road Tripping at the End of the World. This podcast was recorded on April 24, 2020. We discussed her book, Presidential, U.S. Foreign Policy, the 2020 Elections, how the COVID-19 virus is disproportionately affecting black Americans, and the historic opportunity for fundamental change that is presenting itself during this current crisis. I opened our conversation by making the observation that U.S. Americans are not taught the real history of their nation and its white supremacist nature. Americans don't like to think of themselves as being propagandized, but we are most definitely propagandized from childhood on about the nature of this nation, which was founded as a settler colonial state, which means that the uh, original inhabitants, the indigenous population, were immediately the victims of genocide, and uh, that that continued with chattel slavery. So we have two great crimes which impacted this nation, its founding, and its history to this very day. And we can see these terrible crimes committed at various points in our our history from the very beginning, from George Washington on to Donald Trump. There's a chapter for every president. And uh, we see how in uh, their interactions with or treatment of black people, they have all defended the system. When the system in the early days was supporting chattel slavery, which was a major, major economic generator for the country, 10 of the first 12 presidents were slaveholders. And that tells you how important that was, the so-called peculiar institution, how important it was to the American economy. And so we see after um, there was a war, the only way to end slavery was through the Civil War. But Lincoln is problematic. He was not the great emancipator we are taught. He wanted a white nation and wanted black people to leave the country and talked about making that happen as the late as a week before he was assassinated. The all too brief reconstruction, the decades of Jim Crow, the presidents who, some of whom were openly racist and made clear they had no intention of uh, upholding legal or human rights for black people and those who talked a good game and marketed themselves well, but still didn't do it. So 
these are the facts of the story. And as you said, it's um, very well researched, if I may say so myself. This is not just commentary, which I ordinarily do. Uh, many hours in many libraries spent getting this information. And uh, I, I think it's important to start speaking in this way to tell people that uh, Lincoln isn't who he thought, that the Kennedy brothers had to be dragged to uh, support civil rights, even in the small ways that they did, that Woodrow Wilson was an open racist, that those even those presidents who were not slaveholders did not dare oppose the, uh, the forces known as the uh, slave power or the slaveocracy. So all of these things are true. The evidence is there. And it's important for Americans to become accustomed to knowing these facts so that we don't succumb to this uh, siren song of the great and wonderful nation. Right. The city, the uh, shining city upon the hill. Yes, yes. So it's always it's always something positive, and those who raise any of the inconvenient truths are often shouted down or, you know, smeared in some way. Uh, a few years ago, there was an effort to update the curriculum for the advanced placement tests for American history for high school students, and there was this fierce outcry, and the Educational Testing Service backed down. And uh, went back to the whitewash, the cover-up of history. So it's a funny thing. A few years ago, when uh, shortly after Trump was elected, there was the, I'm going to call it a riot in Charlottesville, Virginia, right. of um, uh, open white supremacists. And Trump at the time said, well, and this all began with an effort to remove Confederate monuments. And Trump said, well, uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to remove Jefferson and Washington's monuments because they own slaves? And the New York Times took a poll of their readers and only 4% wanted to remove Jefferson and Washington monuments. And these are Times readers are generally not Trump supporters, but it just shows you how deeply ingrained this thinking is in our country that people in uh, their desire to be positive want to say that really evil deeds are of no consequence or explain them away or say that he was a, a character of his times and at this time in history some horrible thing was acceptable and try to end the conversation. Right. What's the best response for that particular one of, well, he was just a product of his times? Yeah, I, you know, I think we have to tell people that even in those times, there were people who spoke up. There were people who said slavery was wrong. An example, one of Jefferson's contemporaries, a um, Polish uh, nobleman who fought in the Revolutionary War, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, he was a slaveholder himself. He ended up freeing people. He left uh, Jefferson money in his will because Jefferson would always claim he couldn't afford to free anybody. And so Kosciuszko said, OK, um, I'm going to leave you money and use it to free people when I'm dead. Well, he, he died before Jefferson and uh, Jefferson didn't free anybody. So there were people who thought about it then. There were states that tried to limit slavery. There were people, there were abolitionists. Um, you know, Lincoln was not. The Republican Party was founded to stop the spread of slavery. But there were people who were uh, uncompromising. And I quote one of them, Wendell Phillips. There was John Brown. I, I tell people if you want to admire a white man in the 1800s, then you should pick John Brown, who when he um, attempted the attack on the federal arsenal at uh, Harper's Ferry, his goal was to start a slave insurrection. So he was an uncompromising foe of slavery at that moment in history. So it is not true that these people were um, uniformly supported. There were always people who fought back against uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the red, so-called Red Summer after World War I, where there were vicious uh, mob attacks ac across the country against black people. And there was a politician in Missouri, his name was Leonidas Dyer. There was a terrible um, uh, mob attack on black people in East St. Louis, right across the river, East St. Louis, Illinois. And he begged Wilson to do something. He spoke up when Theodore Roosevelt court-martialed black soldiers in Brownsville, Texas, who were falsely accused of murder. 
Uh, and he did so a few days after Election Day to get votes for Black people first. And Ohio Senator Foraker was quite public in his denunciation of what Roosevelt did. So there were always people who said no. And we need to make them heroes. We need to find out about the people who resisted. Uh, President Harrison, um, uh, his campaign theme was Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, which I always knew. And I was grown uh, only a few years ago. I knew that Tippy Canoe was a battle against Tecumseh the Shawnee Nation, who was resisting American encroachment on his territory. So we need to know about Tecumseh and how he fought back. We need to know about Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman. We need to know about all the people who were heroic in trying to do the right thing. They were always there. Those are the names that people need to to hear about and to know. Right, because all through history, there's been the mainstream of events that have been going on and the big names that people hear about and all that. But at the same time, there's been a side stream to that mainstream of resistance and critique that has existed uninterrupted that entire time as well. Yes, yes, there has been. And I, I can recommend, of course, I want people to, to buy my book, but I, people should read uh, Howard Zinn, The People's History of the United States, and read James uh, Lowe and Lies My Teacher Told Me, and, and I'm blanking on the name of his other book. But they are among the people uh, who your listeners should become familiar with, because we're always finding out something new. We have been lied to so much in our educational system. We're lied to so much by the corporate media. It's, it can be very difficult to find out the information that we need uh, in order to know why the country is the way it is and what we need to do to change it. But just to shrug our shoulders and say, well, at that time, something horrible was OK. We don't say that for anything else, by the way. And it's just a dodge. People want to get out of, um, I think, dealing with the present because all of these things, the history of uh, anti-black racism and slavery and Jim Crow impacts how we live now. Without a true reckoning, uh, black people will stay on the bottom. And it's because of this history. So I think often when people uh, say these things, they know to some degree that this past informs their present and that if they face the fact of these injustices, they will have to do something different in their lives. So it's hard to take in information and not do something about it. So it's easier to say it was a long time ago or, you know, Jefferson was really brilliant. We shouldn't care that he owned a couple hundred people or or whatever. Uh, any of the excuses that are used. So I think those are some of the ways in which we can counter those those arguments. Certainly. And one theme that I noticed that was kind of running through the background of your whole book was the um, conundrum facing Black people themselves as to which presidents or candidates they should support or not support at any given time. Yeah, this is a, this is a sad story. Uh, after the end of the Civil War, and some black people had the mostly in the North, briefly in the South, also had the right to vote. We faced this problem of one of the political parties being seen as more friendly or less hostile to us. So uh, in Reconstruction, even into the 20th century, it was the Republican Party. The Democrats were the party of the segregated South. So it's generally Republicans who uh, we wanted to get elected and hoped they would get anti-lynching legislation passed. Or there was a Civil Rights Act passed during the Reconstruction era and the Supreme Court struck it down. So there was always some hope that presidents uh, in the late 1800s that a Republican would lead the charge and undo that and pass some legislation to bring it back. But that wouldn't happen. And then there would be, you know, Democrats like FDR or Harry Truman who would always complain, well, you know, I need the Southerners, so I can't do whatever it was that black people happen to need. And that happened up until the 60s. And uh, Kennedy chose Johnson as his running mate. That's how you balance the ticket with a Northerner and a Southerner. He was not friendly to civil rights. His first meeting with Martin Luther King was in secret. They didn't want it to be known he, had, he met with him. 
Bobby Kennedy was hostile to the civil rights movement. They gave permission, gave uh, J. Edgar Hoover permission to wiretap uh, Martin Luther King, didn't want the march on Washington. And then we get, it goes on and on where Democrats are preferred. Uh, well, then at the end of the uh, in the late 60s and onwards, the Republicans become the white people's party and the Democrats, the black people's party. So we see Jimmy Carter making at, at that time school busing for integration was the hot issue, talking about ethnic purity of neighborhoods and how that shouldn't be. He was opposed to get rid of the ethnic purity of neighborhoods for the purposes of integration. We had Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat, and he you know, executed a mentally ill uh, uh, black man during his uh, campaign in 1992. Uh, the way he uh, dumped Lonnie Guineer's nomination, the uh, photo ops with black people in prison, the sister soldier moment, embarrassing Jesse Jackson, uh, getting rid of the right to public assistance, which existed from the time of Roosevelt. Mass incarceration, the crack cocaine legislation, these had a terrible impact on black people. Uh, and we see it happening now in 2020, in a presidential election year, the black leadership, so-called, as we say at Black Agenda Report, the black misleadership class, are joined at the hip with the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, their main priority was getting rid of Bernie Sanders. I, they don't care about winning the presidency as much as they cared about getting rid of him, I believe. And black people are told all we need to be told is that a certain person is more electable and has the greater ability to win. And we forget everything we need or don't forget, but we believe we've been convinced that uh, the only way to keep Republicans out of office is to just go along with whomever the Democrats serve up. And if they make the case well enough that this is a person who can win, we negate our own needs. So Joe Biden will be the nominee and he was always one of the more conservative Democrats. That's why Obama chose him, actually. That is the new balancing of the ticket in these times. He not only is a mediocrity, not only has some sort of health problem. I don't, I'm a lay person. I don't want to diagnose him. But he's very problematic as a candidate. And this is four years after we were convinced that Trump could not win. There was no way Trump could win. And these same people who said Trump couldn't win, are now con trying to convince us that Biden can win. But black politics is very fear-driven. Black voters are very risk-averse. And so now we see a replay of what we saw in the Reconstruction era. And at that time, Frederick Douglass, a great man, one of our great leaders in the country's history, would always assure black people that this or that Republican was going to be the stand-up guy for black people, and it would never happen. And that's where we are now in the year 2020. Right. And when it comes to voting in 2020, I think something that a lot of people haven't noticed is that the right to vote is under assault now and, and it has been reduced to levels previous before. So, I mean, to, to say it another way, I think that more black people were probably able to vote, say, 10, 20 years ago than nowadays because of the disenfranchisements that have happened, such as, you know, interstate cross check and the postcard purges and all of that. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. And it's something if the Democrats don't address it, Biden will lose. Democrats always need a huge turnout because of these efforts to uh, diminish black voting. That's how Republicans win, by stealing black votes. That is one of the things that's just not talked about. It's interesting, this year, we have this constant haranguing of the left. They're already planning to lose. I can see that. Uh, if Biden loses, it will be the fault of progressives for not supporting him well enough uh, not apparently the people pushing him have no responsibility to get him elected. And that is something that even Democrats, Al Gore and Hillary Clinton, when there's this uh, loss in the electoral college, it's always a Democrat who's the victim, but they never even bring it up. This has been really mystifying to me. This and, of course, the lack of attention given to the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. Why is it that the Democratic leadership doesn't seem to be interested 
and defending the ability of its voters to vote. I, you know, it's a funny thing. I think they are more interested in uh, being part of the permanent government. And I, I think they, they need black votes, but they wish they didn't. That's, that's what wow. I have often said. They don't want to be identified with black people. So even though they need our votes in order to win, they sacrifice themselves in order to keep from alienating white people. And that's also, that's always their dream that they, they won't need us. And so they constantly talk about, you know, over the years, how do we get the silent majority vote? How do we get the Reagan Democrat? How do we get the Tea Party? How do we get Trump's base? And there's never any talk of energizing their own base. So they hope to thread the needle and get through And also ignore the people who are their uh, most loyal constituency because because they are racist as well. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that seems clear. I I, I don't remember there being any real remedy offered for the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. It's a funny thing. They I mean, well, it's not funny. It's part of their overall pattern of behavior over the years. It's a funny thing. When Obama was president, they lost so many seats. They lost control of the Senate and didn't seem to care about it very much. Uh, We were always assured that uh, the Voting Rights Act would be renewed and renewed and renewed. And it was for uh, many decades. But thanks to the Democrats not taking the action they needed to take, it was finally They finally took all the teeth out of it. And immediately, immediately, we saw these voter suppression efforts. I also think it's because they decided to be the party of corporate interests along with Republicans. And that is their priority, is getting this money, getting the backing of the big pharma, the military, anybody with a lot of cash. That's their priority. And they will sacrifice their people in order to get it. Right. That seems very clear that that's what Bill Clinton was all about with the Democratic Leadership Council and all that in the 90s. Yes, yes. Which they don't even have anymore. They got rid of it. They don't need it. So everybody's on board with uh, being the corporate party. Right. Sanders was seen by some as being a little bit different from that. And, and I guess that he was a little bit different from that. But we uh, we saw that even a little bit different was too much different, you know, for, for the leadership when they've done what they did. Oh, sure. Well, it was, you know, by, if you're going to say Medicare for all, there's no need for a private health insurance. And uh, he presented a huge threat to the Democratic Party and their funders. And that is why getting rid of him was the most important thing and not in winning. Because even if they wanted to win, would you, you know, coalesce around Biden? No, you'd pick, I don't know, you'd pick Elizabeth Warren or someone who's not uh, who's able to talk uh, while reading from a teleprompter and who could get uh, some degree of turnout. But they decided that getting rid of Bernie was the most important thing. I, well, we'll see. I think there's still a, a chance that at the uh, convention, we'll find out that Biden was just a placeholder and they'll put some other corporate Well, there's Democrat. that too. There could be some kind of intrigue. This is going to be a, uh, an interesting year because we will... <laughs> I mean, there's some people who say they're going to wait and try to put Hillary in. There are people who say Biden will step aside. They'll find somebody else. I mean, who knows? I, I, but they have a, a nominee they have to hide. I mean, look at what's going on. Uh, every day, Trump goes on television and embarrasses him. Well, I don't know if he's able to be embarrassed. He said he felt no responsibility. But the latest thing was yesterday he said, He asked about, you know, could you disinfect your body to prevent COVID? And the kindest thing you could say is maybe he meant antiseptic. But then he said something about ultraviolet light. I mean, it was absurd. So but the Democratic, they've already they've got it sewed up. But you have a candidate who they can't put on television, who can't they can't put on video. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually in a smoke filled room at this moment planning somebody else. Right. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to switch gears to um, to the present moment. 
uh, and to the crisis that we are facing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. You've been writing mm -hmm. extensively about this um, at the Black Agenda Report. And one thing that you've talked about is how medical care is completely different uh, for black people. You've described how getting trying to get medical care Quote, when black people need medical care, they are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Yep. <laughs> well, we're seeing, you know, black people have always been treated worse. Uh, even when we seek medical care, there's a terrible history. There's a great book called Medical Apartheid about that. So we have, uh, we live in, a, all of us are victims of a society with a for-profit healthcare system, which means it's not meant to meet people's needs, which means they get rid of hospital beds. Uh, everybody in New York is, I, I, or I'll rather outside of New York, is I'm so impressed with Governor Cuomo. Basically, you know, Trump has lowered the bar so much if you're not an idiot people are impressed. Uh, but he got rid of many hospital beds in New York State. Uh, so we have this uh, combination of a, a for-profit health system, which doesn't meet people's needs, where uh, insurance is tied to employment. And even those insurance policies don't pay for things that people need, plus the racism black people face when we seek medical care. And I'm seeing these very disturbing stories of people in places like Detroit, where there's a big problem with COVID, a majority black city, and people go to the hospital numerous times for help and don't get it. Now, partly that's because they don't have enough tests. They don't know what they're doing in the, to treat this disease. But if there's any triaging, even if there's any way to choose who gets treated well and who doesn't, we are the ones who are left out. And we're seeing how, our, how bad our society is. This is a failed state, as I said in one of my columns. And uh, Trump famously said, uh, how do we prevent people from immigrating from shithole countries? Well, we are the shithole country where there weren't enough tests, where they failed the first time, where we don't have a, uh, a health care system that can respond quickly. All this blaming China. China built new hospitals in a little over a week uh, with their command economy. So we're in a very all of us are in a very bad situation Plus, black people are less likely to be able to work from home. Only 20 percent of black people can work from home. Instead, they work in uh, retail or home health aides or transit workers, all kinds of jobs, which you can only do by going to work and thus are more likely to be victims. So this is a very, very uh, serious problem uh, and now we see people unemployed, 20 million new unemployment applications, uh, thanks to neoliberal austerity and starving governments of money. States have like 50-year-old computer systems and people can't even access the unemployment that they've earned. It's, it's, it's really quite horrific. in a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... <laughs> And we have protests that are happening now that uh, you just went ahead and described as being white supremacist or, or the participants as being white supremacist. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's um, it's sad. It's very sad to see people actually protest against their own health or the fact that they don't believe uh, Trump and Fox News uh, initially said it's a hoax and it's only uh, this is used to embarrass Trump. There was a, a very sad story in the New York Times last week, a man who owned a bar in Brooklyn who passed away from COVID. And his daughter said if Sean Hannity had told him to wear a mask, he would have worn one. But there are millions of people who are skeptical. And I think it's good to be a skeptic. But their skepticism is based on anger, based on fear, based on racism. 
and they are very short-sighted. They don't deal in reality, the people who show up. And, and if you want the, a state to reopen, why do you have to bring an assault weapon? There are apparently millions of people in this country are looking for an excuse to shoot people. Out they come with their Trump signs and their American flags. And it's quite frightening. And medical workers, nurses standing in the streets trying to block them from blocking uh, uh, ambulances and other just blocking the route to a hospital. It's, it's quite horrible to see. But that's the foundation of the country. Uh, and I think Trump's election gave those people license to come forward, but they were always there. Trump is such a polarizing figure because their presence, their very existence, I think, was a shock to so many people. This, I think, is partly what's been behind what some people have called Trump derangement syndrome, in which people are so upset about Trump, they seem to see nothing else going on, you know? And in my experience, it seems like part of this is just that what you just said, People are shocked that someone like Trump exists or yes. even, even could be elected. And, you know, I was raised in Omaha, Nebraska, which was a, a very segregated city and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a very racist uh, place. And I just commonly heard racist jokes growing up, just as a matter of course, not from my own parents. They were better than that. But I mean, I just heard them. So, so to me, the existence of Trump is not shocking. You know, I, I, yeah. I, when he got elected, I watched his acceptance speech and I'm like, oh, I see why the people from Nebraska who I grew, grew up with, it, I see why they like him. Oh, sure. And there are people in New York who like him. They're in the minority, but uh, he is them. He, uh, you know, Trump's only political skill is that he knows his people and he knows how to get them wound up. And uh, he can tweet, liberate Wisconsin or liberate Pennsylvania or something, and they come running out in their trucks and their assault weapons. Yeah, they, they do exist. And it's, uh, you know, it's so funny. I, I, would, I, I would love to see a good definitive book written about Trump's presidency. I think there was obviously miscalculation. I think Hillary Clinton was, everybody wants to act like the issue with her emails and uh, her using a private server instead of the State Department was not a problem, but she had a huge legal problem in 2016. And I believe she spent most of that year worrying about that. And she was so convinced she was going to win that they dispensed with the huge voter turnout that you need to win an election. Obama, Obama's people did that very well. They had huge voter turnout apparatus in 2008 and 2012. And uh, she just didn't do it. And uh, there was also no recognition uh, that these people <laughs> exist. And he's the one who generated excitement. He's the one who got he got two million more votes than Mitt Romney did in 2012. Oh, I didn't know and, that. And uh, yeah, he did. Uh, she is the one who couldn't hold together the coalition that Obama had built. And, you know, it's a funny thing. All these experts in the Democratic Party, these people who make millions of dollars. I After Obama won in 2008, I, I knew part of the reason he won is that there were people who were normally disaffected who came out to vote for him. The uh, concept of change, uh, the first black president, especially in the black community. My, I was born in Ohio. Uh, that's my parents' home. And I remember looking at the electoral map in 2008 to see how he won Ohio because Democrats hadn't been able to for a while. And there was a sea of red with these blue dots. And if you know that state, you knew those blue dots were the cities and majority black and black people came out in huge numbers to vote for him. And that happened. And he even won Indiana. I mean, some that first time. And uh, I remember saying to myself, I said, these people, the people who came out just for him, they weren't going to come out for any other Democrat. And I wondered, I said, what are they going to do when Obama's name isn't on the ballot anymore? And apparently I was the only one asking. And these million dollar consultants for Hillary Clinton didn't bother asking. But uh, the fish stinks from the head. And that means her. And she did not do what she needed to do to win. And I, I believe I, I, I've always said Trump's victory was the fault of the Democratic Party. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was definitely theirs to lose. And you know, obviously the media, the corporate media had a big part to play in that, too, with all the free airtime that they gave him. Yes, yes, they did. And they bragged about it. It's like, oh, we're getting good ratings from Trump. But they were promoting him. He got 
I think I've seen figures of, you know, a couple billion dollars in free advertising just from press coverage. It, it's a funny thing. Someone once told me that if given the choice between voting for a politician or a celebrity, people will vote for a celebrity. And uh, I, I remember that ever since the election night 2016, that, you know, lest we forget, Ronald Reagan became a governor. Arnold Schwarzenegger became a governor. And California is a blue state. He still won. So uh, this allure of famous people and, and Trump is a con man. He's a successful businessman. No, he isn't. He filed bankruptcy six different times. I, you know, Trump's business is now is basically him marketing his name, selling his name. He doesn't even build anymore. But he people saw him on TV, or, you know, reality TV became real reality, didn't it, in a strange way? And that combined with uh, Hillary Clinton's weaknesses, he was able to squeak through this election victory. And also, he said things that she should have been saying. Uh, I don't know if you remember him saying, I want the Republican Party to be the Workers Party. Well, that should have been her line when he talked about bringing jobs back that had gone overseas, which he didn't mean. That should have been her line. But that is something Democrats do when he talked about the trade deals that had stolen jobs. He didn't mean any of those things. But the Democrats, it finally caught up to them. Their adherence to the uh, what the corporate interests want, that we had a trade deal that they even wanted to hide from members of Congress. The last one, the... Um, uh, not uh, the TPP. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Huh. Uh, they couldn't even get get copies of the legislation to members of Congress. They had to go to a special room and read it there, and they they weren't allowing anybody to see it. Well, that tells you how horrible it was, and the fact that it didn't meet the interests of people in the U.S. or any place else on the planet. But that's what they are. Um, they're beholden to that now, and so they can't they can't fight against it. So when Trump said things like that, he was able to squeak through those in those states and in the absence of the Democrats doing the get out of vote effort that they needed, he was able to win. I mean, 10,000. I mean, it's ridiculous to me. Uh, Hillary Clinton could not get 10,000 more votes in Michigan. I mean, that's just that's just incompetence. Also, of course, the voter suppression that we talked about, that's always ever present. But for the Democrats to just give up those states and think that they didn't have to do anything is criminal. And for those same people to still be calling the shots, to still be telling people, wagging their fingers, you've got to support Biden. If he doesn't win, it's on you in order to escape uh, blame for their own debacle is, is really disgraceful. Yeah, ab absolutely. I haven't voted for a Democrat since 92. Bill Clinton's first term uh, disillusioned me just because of all the promises that, that he broke. I, I saw that they were they were liars, you know, and and oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I will admit that, that the excitement behind Sanders this year, especially among the young people, had me giving him a thought, if only to help support the young people and what they wanted. So I flirted with the idea, but now he's out. And so I, it occurred to me, <laughs> I mean, it occurred to me, wow, you know, there were other people who would only have voted for the Democrat if Sanders was at the top of the ticket, who will not vote for that ticket with anyone else at the top of it. Oh, absolutely. Bernie Sanders would have won. I am convinced he would beat Trump. And the Democrats knew that. But they did not want a president who could in any way endanger their joined at the hip partnership with corporate interests. So they knew Bernie could win. That's why they attacked him so much. They knew he would. And they propagandize people and gaslight people. Oh, he'll be like McGovern or uh, we'll lose a lot of seats, never saying anything about the 1,000 seats that were lost when uh, Obama was uh, president. But I, I, too, gave up on the Democratic Party. I finally officially became a member of the Green Party. For years, I, would, I was a registered Democrat who would vote Green when uh, there was a Green candidate on the ballot. But we need to build a real people's party, a real workers party, a real peace party. And that's not the Democrats. It just isn't. And, you know, Bernie Sanders, I don't know why he bothered to run. I, I just don't. He he caved completely. He uh, for him to just give up uh, when there were more primaries. But I think the Democratic uh, Party establishment had just beaten him down and uh, he didn't have the fight in him. 
So he basically repudiated everything he said during the campaign. Biden says, I, I would veto Medicare for all. And the reality was, even if Sanders won, he would have had to fight his own party in order to get it. But the other reason I, I became a Green is that I, I cannot support these people. I cannot support the war makers and the aggressions around the world, the proxy wars, the uh, regime change, the sanctions that kill people. I can't support that anymore. And so I became uh, and am still a Green. That's my biggest issue with, with Sanders and with the Democrats as well. And you recently wrote a column about how uh, even during this current crisis we're having here, where most of society is getting shut down, uh, we're still pushing forward. The nation, the Pentagon, the State Department is still pushing forward with belligerent behavior against Venezuela and Iran. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes, we have, uh, you know, sanctions. It's, uh, I don't think people know what sanctions mean. Uh, when the United States sanctions a country, in this case, let's say uh, Venezuela or Iran, not only can Americans not do any financial transactions with those countries, but any country that does is itself sanctioned by the U.S., so in effect, U.S. sanctions are international sanctions. So Venezuela can't do any financial transactions anywhere in the world. So they can't buy medicine. Same thing with Iran, with Zimbabwe, with Nicaragua, with Cuba. These countries are devastated and people die as surely as if you dropped a bomb on them. Someone actually did a study and 40,000 Venezuelans have died as a result of U.S. sanctions. There's, they're also a pretext to war, to actual hot war. We, we have to be very careful. Uh, we saw them, this, this phony indictment of President Maduro for, as a narco trafficker. Uh, and then they claim Iranian, these small Iranian boats are threatening big U.S. naval ships. I think they will, if they think they can get away with it, they will start a hot war. That, I think, was their goal when they assassinated the Iranian general, Soleimani, earlier this year, who was on a peace mission. This was a war crime by any definition. But they are constantly, constantly looking for a way to bring down governments that they don't like. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Venezuela is not going to give up. And why should they? We should be supportive of them. We should be supportive of Iran. And people on the left have to get over this idea that they have to like uh, somebody who's declared an enemy of the United States. What we have to do is oppose intervention strongly uh, without ifs, ands, buts, without his hesitation. It's our responsibility to keep our country in check and to at the very least speak up when it's aggressive towards other countries. Right. Now, you're also involved with the Black Alliance for Peace, right? Yes, I am on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. We were founded four years ago on April 4th, a significant date. It's the date of Martin Luther King's assassination. And it's also the date he was assassinated the year to the day after he opposed uh, um, the war in Vietnam. And our goal is to organize around the country, to raise consciousness, to raise awareness, to do away with this fearful black politics that I spoke of earlier, and to resurrect the black radical tradition. And we are obviously against all U.S. intervention, uh, opposed to militarism here in this country, uh, against black people, this uh, 1033 program, we've seen local police who have military equipment, who have tanks. And this is a program that started during the Obama years of giving surplus military equipment to American police departments. We want to stop these sanctions. We want to close down AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, which has uh, troops in many different African countries and, and makes African nations de facto puppet states of the U.S. And to close all these foreign military bases, to cut the uh, military budget in half, 60% of our budget goes to the military. And that's why we don't have enough hospital beds. It's why states don't have a modern IT system that they can process unemployment applications. It's why we don't have so many things, why we have crumbling schools, why we have a crumbling infrastructure, why we don't have high-speed trains and, and the Chinese do. Uh, so those are the things that we are committed to fighting 
uh, against and fighting for. The U.S. militarism obviously is also problematic uh, in terms of the rest of the world being able to cooperate together on issues that exist at a global scale because you've got this big bully stomping through the room all the time, just swinging wildly. Sure. And so a lot of the NATO nations, America's allies, they just do whatever the president, American president, whichever president tells them to do. Uh, there was footage of Boris Johnson and Justin Trudeau and someone else. They were, you know, on a hot mic talking about Trump and how they didn't like him. But I, it didn't impress me any because he, they do whatever he tells them to do. The British tried to keep an Iranian oil tanker from sailing out of Gibraltar. Trump told them to do it, and they did. Trump tells them to snatch Julian Assange, and they do. Trump told the Canadians to arrest the daughter of the director of uh, the uh, Huawei uh, telecom company in China and, and make up some story about them doing business with Iran, which has nothing to do with Canada, by the way. And they should have told them no, but they did it and created an international incident for themselves. So they all go along with the United States. When Trump claimed he didn't like NATO, no, he just wanted to goad them into spending more money on defense, which they all did. Hey, you mentioned Julian Assange in there, and I know that you've been um, following that story very, very closely. I was part of a webinar, and it's posted on YouTube, um, UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition. It's on their channel. Uh, it's UNAC webinar, the prosecution of Julian Assange and the fight for free speech. And I took part in this along with uh, several other people making the case that Julian Assange must be defended. I'm uh, a contributor to the book In Defense of Julian Assange, published by OR Books. And if people act this week, you can get it, uh, the ebook for just $3. And myself and many other people make the case for why Julian Assange should not be extradited to the U.S., why the indictment against him is a sham. It would be a show trial. In my chapter, I point out that many liberals don't uh, defend Assange because he has been painted as one of those at fault for Trump winning. The fact that WikiLeaks published the DNC emails, which were so embarrassing to the Democrats. And, and it's not true. And while, we're, while I'm on that subject, it is not true that the Russians hacked the DNC. There's no evidence that anybody hacked the DNC, um, WikiLeaks, as its name tells us, got a leak. Someone gave them material, gave them the emails. Basically, they told us that Hillary Clinton was corrupt. But even, even that, even uh, with that, if they had been serious with the get out the vote effort, she would have defeated Donald Trump. And her own emails, she was hiding the fact that she was due as Secretary of State was doing the business of the Clinton Foundation, which was actually an influence peddling slush fund. And that's why she hid her emails. And that is why she created a legal problem for herself. And that's how Russiagate began. It was an effort by her and her friends in the national security state to create some dirt on Trump. Uh, as if they needed to create any. But she was, I think, anticipating having a legal problem and she wanted to have something to use against him. But right. that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I, I remember that she's also the one, or her campaign, is originally uh, the one who made up the term fake news. Originally, they yes, were using that. Mm -hmm. They were yes. using that to describe stories that they were saying, oh, the Russians planted this story or whatever. And then Trump got that one. And so that one really boomeranged on them. Yes, I think that's very funny. Every time uh, the fact that people connect the, the term with with Trump when it's uh, really hers. But uh, yeah, it's uh, and, and Russiagate has done great damage to this country, to the media, to the Democratic Party, people now, after years of hearing about uh, Russian influence, hate Russia without any reason to feel that way. It's just that they've been told that over and over. And the people who could argue, who could debunk Russiagate, uh, have been kept out of public discourse. And so now they're starting with China, blaming China for and, and just for the record, the Chinese government told the World Health Organization at the end of December that they had this new disease on their hands. They called it a pneumonia. They thought it was SARS, but they knew they had a problem and told the World Health Organization 
they um, presented the genome to the world in early January. So everything you've heard about China lying is a lie. And it's the U.S. that now is fudging figures on uh, COVID-19 deaths that can't even give reliable figures because uh, uh, this country couldn't even get its act together and have a, a widespread testing mechanism. So now people blame Russia for everything, for anything. And it's all about power politics and the United States not wanting to have any country that can be a rival in the world. But for the sake of the world, the U.S. does need rivals. China is mostly an economic rival. Russia is physically a, a rival, being on the border of Russia, also being an oil producer. And Russia is not going to and should not knuckle under the United States. And it's a good thing that Russia stepped in and kept the Assad government from falling in Syria. Uh, the United States does not have the right to just decide to get rid of Gaddafi or get rid of Assad. And you don't have to defend Assad and you don't have to say he's a good guy. You have to stand for the doctrine that the U.S. cannot wage these wars of aggression and just kill people and to get support for doing so by convincing the rest of us that there's a tyrant in charge. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, wanting to make Russia into a villain was also something that was on Hillary's agenda. The the journalist Abby Martin, I'm sure, sure you know her, and mm -hmm. her brother, Robbie Martin, do a podcast, The Empire Files, and they did an episode last year where they went back through their old episodes and showed how the anti-Russia thing started as early as 2014 uh, among the Democrats. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This was something of long standing. The, the coup against the Ukrainian government, um, Ukraine had an elected president. Viktor Yanukovych was elected by the people of Ukraine. It's a, a country with a history of division, geographic division, a large Russian-speaking region, Crimea, has more Russian than Ukrainian residents, by the way, and that's why I believe they would vote to be part of Russia again. But uh, the United States uh, sided with the far right in Ukraine. Some of these people are actual Nazis, and the U.S. overthrew the elected government of Ukraine in order to thwart Russia's power and did this right on a country right on Russia's border. And that kind of thing pisses people off, you know. So and uh, the Russians had a naval base in Crimea. And uh, that is why they annexed Crimea. That was their reaction to this threat. That's not going to change. And sanctions against Russia and sanctions against Crimea, it's just ridiculous. Uh, Russia built, in fact, built a railway connecting Crimea to the rest of uh, Russia. So anybody thinking that uh, that's going to change can just forget about it. But the United States stoked this uh, there's now a civil war in Ukraine. Ukraine is a failed state. And this is all the handiwork of the U.S. and of Joseph Biden, who was the Ukraine point person. I find it hard to believe that the Republicans are not going to mention the fact that he set up his son in this cushy job when he was uh, the Ukraine uh, point person. Ukraine is, in, for all intents and purposes, an American colony. And that's what we need to know about it. And that occurred early in 2014. But even before that, we had been getting this Putin evil message. And it's, and it's very unfortunate to me that people, even people who want to be well informed, so they, you know, read the paper every day, watch the news, listen to NPR, but they listen to the same propaganda. So no matter how much you expose yourself to this, you still don't know what's going on in the world, uh, which is why independent media is so important. Absolutely. And, and independent media has been one of the targets of all of this, of the new McCarthyism the last few years. Oh, sure. Right after Hillary Clinton lost, there was a Black Agenda report was placed on this list, prop or not, propaganda or not, that appeared in the Washington Post meaning it's a Jeff Bezos project, that uh, listed us, Black Agenda Report, among the sites that were said to be under Russian influence. And it was basically a list of sites that were independent and provided a counter-narrative. So uh, we had no reason to be upset about being placed on the list. Actually, we were rather pleased. It meant that we were doing our job 
and that uh, we uh, uh, have a, a voice in independent media that's still going on, but people don't know anything about Russia. The things you see in the New York, it's disgraceful to me, in the New York Times, they do, for all their supposed liberalism, they repeat what any American president says on foreign policy, and that includes Trump. They, Trump, in fact, he gets praise when he, you know, is threatening to bomb Syria or attack Iran. They line right up and defend everything he says. Yeah, I mean, the whole the whole tie between uh, liberals and, and war and Democrats and war, I think is probably a topic for a whole nother discussion. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. We've come up with so many discussions in one discussion. Yes, yes, we, you're right. We, we, we have. And, I, and I've held you on the line for a whole hour. So I thought maybe <laughs> I thought maybe I could just ask you one more question, sure. um, which is that some people and I think you've, you've written about this, too, that the crisis with the pandemic that's going on right now that's disrupting business as usual to such a degree is obviously causing a lot of you know harm and suffering for a lot of people and yet at the same time this could also be an opportunity to remake things after this yes it is a, you know there's some normal we don't we shouldn't want to go back to and we have to face the fact that we're now in this economic crisis because, first of all, the economy wasn't doing well before. Before we heard of COVID-19, whenever we heard about jobs growth, whether it was Trump, whether it was Obama, it was phony. It was low-wage jobs growth. People are in a desperate situation. Half the population is low income. The minimum wage hasn't gone up in 10 years. But you don't hear the Democratic Party, the supposed opposition, talking about any of that. And uh, I think the fact that this uh, presidential election is taking place at the same time, we now know for certain that the electoral effort is a loser in this country. Uh, we have to upend so many things. We have to get rid of this idea once and for all that the Democratic Party can be the party to bring about the changes that we need. And we have to talk about how we're going to move on, move away from them, because they are the problem. They are a bigger problem because people look to them and they fail and they fail intentionally. So this is an opportunity for us to question many different things and not to act as though the pre-COVID days were all wonderful because they were not. No, no, they sure weren't. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Margaret. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to come back. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big C. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.